Figures that as soon as I finish talking about every other death battle season after a year and a half of on and off work, the newest one finishes at about the same time. It took me a while to get around to this because Christ I was feeling the burnout after only talking about this show on this channel for so long. So I broke it up with a few other projects before finally getting around to this video that people will actually watch. Season 9 is the first season of death battle that, in my opinion at least, followed on from an incredible season and maintained that level of quality. I adore the season to no end and I've had more than my fair share of positive things to say about it in my 15 other videos covering each individual episode as they came out, as well as my ranking of the first half of the season when it went on break, which has actually changed a little bit since then. I'm not including Excalibur vs Raiden by the way, if they're not counting it as part of the episode lineup then I'm not giving myself the extra work. I don't even have anything to say on it really, it's just very funny and Metal Lotus bangs. If you're curious, I would rank it at… I have written here in brackets rewatch the episode first and I forgot to do that. I'm gonna say 10th or 11th place probably. I'll put it as text on screen where I would place it once I do rewatch it, because I'm not delaying this recording to rewatch an episode that I'm not even going to cover. Anyway, those reviews are still out for any who want coverage of an individual episode to be longer and more detailed, even if some of my takes from back then are a little outdated, including one episode where my opinion on it has changed drastically. For those who have seen those videos, plus my ranking of the first half of the season last summer, you won't be getting much new out of this. This is mainly for completion's sake, to say what order I'd have the episodes in, and to update a few scores and placements. It's not like the order is too hard to guess though if you've been keeping up with my content already. I mean, I gave quite the range of scores that still mostly hold up to my current thoughts. But there is Gogeta vs Vegeta, which I haven't covered yet, so at least there's one wild card that really could go any- Never mind. Okay, look, I don't want to rain on anyone's parade here because I know a lot of people love Gogeta vs Vegeta, and that's great. I'm genuinely really happy that people can get enjoyment out of what I don't. I don't even think it's a poorly made episode, I just haven't been this bored, uninterested, and disengaged with a death battle since Nightwing vs Daredevil. The analysis gives me nothing. It's all just trivia that I knew already and jokes that aren't funny. It has so little identity that this is the only episode since Mario vs Sonic to not even have any cutaway gags in the middle. Ironically, despite being the only Dragon Ball analysis since Season 7 to not mention the universe shockwaves, it manages to be the most generic feeling out of all of them. Sure, they include heroes and other composite stuff, but not only does the existence of Trunks vs Silver remove any novelty this might have had before, it adds nothing to the episode. All it brings are more jokes that aren't funny, new forms that don't get used in the animation, unless you count the apparently 11 riveting frames that the Kaioken is visible for, and pretty much equalizing their kit and having them scale to each other. It's not even like it's a debate of Super Saiyan 4 vs Super Saiyan Blue or a difference in mindset. The composite gives them the same forms anyway, and the conclusion helps hopefully debunks the idea that there is any difference in personality between the characters. They are, by most accounts, the same person. So why even bother with the episode? What's the point of a crossover versus show doing an episode between characters from the same series who are essentially identical? Might sound rich coming from the guy with Meta vs Carolina in his top 5 of all time, but the crossover there was more with Red vs Blue in Death Battle itself. Plus, there was at least an interesting dynamic between Meta's strength, Carolina's skill and agility, and the difference in use of their weapons and AI partners. Gogeta vs Vegito has none of that, and the conclusion makes it painfully obvious how much they had to stretch to have anything to say beyond Vegito is canonically better. At least they end by giving the payoff for the obvious joke, and the one thing I was looking forward to where Wiz and Boomstick fuse, and no, actually we don't get to see it, okay then. Well, what about the fight? It also has basically no identity of its own. It's all just generic flying brick action to me. There's no point I'm gonna remember as the really cool part or character interactions that I enjoyed during the battle. Goku calling Vegeta short in a non-malicious way at the start and Vegito fist bumping the statue at the end were fun and charming character moments, I'll give them that much. But that is the very beginning and end of the animation. There is nothing between them. The only bit of banter is the variety line which just annoyed me given what episode it's a part of. Then Gogeta goes blue later anyway despite the analysis claiming that both forms are equal, that's so awesome. The rest of the stuff in the animation that sticks out to me doesn't do so in a positive way. The Big Bang Kamehameha vs Final Kamehameha should have been an awesome beam struggle, but instead they fire them out like Star Wars blaster shots. The reality breaks are cool in concept, but after what we got in Hulk vs Broly, it's hard not to feel underwhelmed by the fade to white teleporting between locations. The Bluff Kamehameha could have potentially been really funny, but they missed the entire point of what made the joke work in GT. That was funny because of the huge build up to the anticlimax where Omega Shenron is shitting himself in 
and fear. Here they rush through it in like two seconds and Vegito barely reacts. The DBX managed to do this joke better. I'm sorry, I just can't get into this one. I might have been more of a fan if it was Gogeta versus Omnimon. Then you can have some interesting stuff happen with different toolkits bouncing off each other. Hell, even a greater size difference than any other episode to make it stand out a bit. And that's what really gets me here. This episode doesn't stand out as mid-season filler, let alone the finale. I didn't need it to live up to Saitama vs Popeye because that's not a fair expectation. But every other finale has something to help it feel more special than other episodes. An experimental style, an increasing cosmic scale or runtime, an ending with a feeling of finality to it, or even all of the above. This one doesn't have any of that. I'm not going to act like it's without its positives, I still think it's a competently put together episode. The effects are nice, hell the entire animation is up to the same visual standard that the rest of season 9 set, even if I think the models are a little too shiny in some shots. There are a couple cool shots here and there, I like the short joke and fist bump like I said before, and the voice acting's pretty good. Michael Kovac definitely fits Zamasu better than Goku himself, but I think he and Lanny did a great job with the lines and especially the screens. The novelty of finally getting to hear Lanny's Vegeta as part of a fusion was also nice. And in the analysis, I like the final line in each rundown. Okay, yeah, there is not much for me to get out of this. I like the stuff I just mentioned, but nothing wowed me or anything. Well, that is other than the music. Good god, I adore Dragon Dance. Maybe one of my top 5 favourite custom tracks of the season. And the most controversial take that I have as a positive takeaway from this entire experience is that I like it a little more than Princess of Pride and Hedge of Tomorrow. The vocals are on point, the instrumental is fire, the lyrics fit perfectly, and also one of my favourite things a song in a series can do is work in parts of previous songs. And this one does that amazingly with Princess of Pride and Alive. That's such an amazing way to call back to those songs. And even though I'll only ever revisit the song instead of the episode, the animation does actually add something of value to it by distorting it when they go into the time chamber, then emphasizing the Chala head chalas at the end, which were too quiet for me to make out in the song's standalone release. What a delight of a song. Buried underneath an episode I otherwise got very little out of. I guess you could call it some kind of buried delight. Unfortunate that the season ended on such a flaccid note for me, but it worked for a lot of other people and I'm glad about that. Please continue to enjoy the episode if you've been doing so already. Do not flip your opinion on a dime to match a rando on the internet who hardly has a clue what he's talking about. Please, I am begging you. What is going on? Cut back to me. What the hell is with this pacing? I was hoping Jason vs. Michael would grow on me more after all this time, but my opinion on it is pretty much unchanged from before. I still can't say that I like this one. None of that is the fault of the analysis, that's just as good as I remember. I love the unique tone that it goes for. It treats it like the hosts are telling campfire stories, which I think excuses the vague versus stuff since that adds to the unsettling nature of these kinds of tales. The teleportation debate is still fun, the cutaways are some of the best this season, and I especially love how they talk about Michael being an embodiment of pure evil who does things with no rhyme or reason. He just is. This is such a fun analysis. The fight though, I'm sorry, this does nothing for me. I'm not gonna rag on Devil Artemis because for one, I think what he did as a one-man show under his life conditions at the time is very impressive. And two, because everyone else in the community has already given their, oh I wish Torium was doing this instead spiel, which is just kind of upsetting to hear. Way to devalue a man's work because he isn't someone else. A certain someone else whose work ethic in the past was documented and is not good for his own health. Great job guys. I love this community. My problems with the episode don't come down to the quality of the animation itself. Sure, it has some movements that are too stiff or cartoony, and the camera at the start is kind of disorienting, but my issues are more with the direction they took the script. By focusing so much on random background NPCs, it means we don't get a whole lot of Jason vs. Michael in the video titled Jason vs. Michael. Oh, but it's a Dead by Daylight avatar, so it's actually related to the characters. I don't get that defense at all. It's not even a character from Dead by Daylight, it's a player avatar model. This changes nothing for me. Half the characters this season are in Fortnite, but I don't think anyone would have been thrilled if they dedicated half of any other animation to Jonesy doing Orange Justice. It fits the vibe of a horror movie since those always focus on the humans instead of the monsters that you're there to see. I mean, if that aids the episode to you, then all the more power to you. But those movies do at the very least give us the action we're there to see when the time comes. And even then, I can't say I'm particularly glad that they focus so much on my least favourite aspect of horror films and crossover versus films 
films in general. It's the same reason I don't think other episodes would benefit from stuff like, say, if Deku vs. Asta stopped everything every five seconds to have a 20 minute flashback, or Spongebob vs. Aquaman had an excessive amount of gross out humour, or if Boba Fett vs. Predator had the worst lighting I've ever seen in my life, or if Bond vs. Wick had a scene of the two having violent gate- wait actually I may be onto something. I haven't talked much about the progression of events in the animation, but that's cause there isn't much to go over. There's a neat setup, a short scuffle where I can't tell what's happening sometimes because of the camera, it then focuses on a random human for most of the rest of the animation as he no sells Michael's axe swing, then later he dies and we finally get the second and last full on screen fight scene between the two characters. Jason gets this cool bit where his mother's words motivate him and it shows his eyes for the only time, showing that he's the only one of the two with even the slightest bit of human emotion or motivation left, and I genuinely love that. Then he proceeds to body Michael immediately and get a decent but kind of underwhelming kill and spend an overly long period of time walking away. I think the atmosphere is well built at the start, there are a few neat shots and small attentions to detail here and there, but as a whole the unfocused nature of the animation leaves me very disappointed and unsatisfied. I'm conflicted on how I feel about the episode in total, cause I think I like the analysis more than I dislike the fight, but the animation typically has more sway in how I feel since it's normally what sticks out to me the most and what I'm more likely to revisit. Weighing all the pros and cons together, I do think the analysis boosts this one enough to make it a perfectly fine package, but not enough to say that I like it overall. But if anything, this is a testament to this season's quality, because this wouldn't be second to last place in almost any of the others. And even though I didn't get much from the experience, most of my horror fan friends who had stakes in the match really liked it, and that's about all that matters to me. Does he have a final smash? We are already into the episodes that I can say that I like, which I know is a loaded statement for this episode in particular. Deku vs Asta seems to be, from what I can tell, the most widely disliked episode of the season, partly because it left its target audience and came across some people who were, let's say, less enthused about their coverage of Black Clover. That's why we got such amazing critiques of the episode like, why isn't Deku dead after the first hit? And, um, Deku is not faster than Luck actually, and they didn't spite Deku enough which all made for a wonderful community response that I greatly enjoyed being there to witness. Even within Death Battle's usual target audience though, this seems to have struck a nerve with the Black Clover fans thanks to Asta's portrayal, which I can't comment on the accuracy of as I have not read or watched Black Clover. I like the analyses here in spite of the best efforts of the cutaway gags. Some jokes work, the coverage of their stories was interesting, the versus stuff was handled in a way that didn't make anything super obvious, and the ending to Deku's analysis in particular flowed incredibly well. Not a favourite, but I enjoyed myself. That goes for the fight too. I don't love it or even feel that strongly towards it, but it's a decent time overall. Deku's the one who mostly gets to shine in terms of the actual combat. His quirks are all used very well, and I like how he gets to use strategy with the smokescreen and the black whip that he disarms Asta with. At the same time though, his melee side feels very underutilized. They only have him go 100% towards the very end where he then goes straight for 1 million percent with nothing between them. There's never a scene where Deku breaks an arm or even a finger and has to push through that for the rest of the fight. You know, the risk reward that's the most interesting part of his toolkit. Asta meanwhile gets to shine far less. He's more of a dispensary for funny hahas and cool shouts, but he doesn't get to do as much. They say in the analysis that he's intelligent as well, but the animation portrays him like a dumb meathead jock who also spends an entire 40 seconds doing absolutely nothing as Deku ping pongs him then mugs him in broad daylight. He never gets his catchphrase equivalent of plus ultra which apparently exists, he never gets to do his banshee scream, his little demon friend doesn't get a single line, it's kind of underwhelming. At least it isn't a one sided beatdown. It's a solid back and forth outside of the controller disconnect in the middle, conveying the speed of the characters decently well. The voice performances are great too. Jose Estrada does a great impression of Deku, and Michael Kovacs Asta has so many great deliveries. That hit me with all you've got line especially is chilling. The track is a banger too. Strongest Alive does the whole reworking previous tracks thing that I mentioned with Dragon Dance. It takes some lyrics from Mighty and Marvel for All, as well as mimicking Mighty's chorus. It's obviously not as good as Mighty, but it slaps in its own right. It's really good stuff, as always. The ending kinda sucks though. Other than the Hercule cameo, he can do no wrong. The rushed feeling of it with Deku dying after the first clash using 100% of his power, the muddled way it's all presented with the two diving down except no they don't, and Deku stabbing the corpse of the guy he should be able to sense is dead. This this falls very flat for me. It has a strong lead up with Deku's line calling back to Might Squared, but Asta stays quiet and then everything else after is downhill. There's only one ending this season I think is worse than this, and it's not the one you're thinking of. 
I have very little new to say about this episode. I still enjoyed it, but I also still feel very little towards it. I still think a lot of scenes could have been restructured to help the pacing and overall flow of things, and it doesn't use the character's toolkits as well as it could have. It is pretty easily the weakest sprite fight since Lex vs Doom. Which, okay, let's talk about that for a second actually. I know I bring up Lex vs Doom as the benchmark for a lot of episodes and have maybe clowned on it one too many times, but I think it goes to show how well the sprite team have their jobs sent to a science that this is their weakest output in the last two years years. And it's not even bad, it's just kind of whatever. They're heading it out of the park so consistently that their weakest showing in season 9 is still a good episode that wouldn't be bottom 3 material in any other season. I can't wait to see what they have in store for season 10, but we have many more bangers from them and the other animation teams to cover in the meantime. Today, please welcome Mr. <laughs> Is it strange to say I have a kind of sentimental attachment to an episode I have ranked this low down? Because that's how I feel about Boba Fett vs the Predator. Without getting into specifics, I wasn't exactly doing great around the time it came out, but watching this episode with friends was one of the bright spots around then for me. And then because I was still making my review of the episode to give myself something to do, I managed to get it out quicker than normal because of how little I had to say about it. Which coincidentally lined up with the last day that most of my online friends were in Texas for RTX. They recorded themselves watching that review and the rest of the group's reaction and I've gone back to that video anytime I've needed something to pick my mood up. That's up. Let's go! So thank you Boba Fett vs Predator for having very little for me to talk about back then. Because if my review was as long as normal, then I would have had to release it the day after, the group would already be home, and I wouldn't have that video to go back to. So in a way, this episode does mean a lot to me. I still don't think it's anything that special as an episode though. I enjoyed it well enough, I wouldn't have ranked it above Deku vs Asa if that wasn't the case. But I don't know, this doesn't grab me quite as much as most others from this year. The analyses are both pretty decent, but I can't say I got that much out of them. It was nice to see Boba get a more modern coverage, but this doesn't do much to set it apart from his season 2 analysis, which I find to be more enjoyable. Or even his original analysis, which is perfect and iconic and I wouldn't change a thing about it. There are one or two solid jokes, and they give us the funny stick, which is one of my favourite things to spawn from watching this with my friends. Other than that, I can watch and enjoy it and not feel that strongly about it. The Predator's analysis, no I'm not using that name, I think is actually a bit better. Now, I know the main point of contention here is that it's a composite predator, which picks attributes from contradictory clans. And I gotta say, I don't really care to be honest. They clarified they were compositing, so I'm not bothered by it for the same reason I'm not bothered by the idea of a composite Pokemon or composite actor fight like Arnold vs Stallone. Sure, there are individual predators with established characters like Wolf, but if you think I'm gonna sit here and say with a straight face, I would have preferred if instead of covering the wider franchise, they exclusively focused on AVP Requiem, then you were off your goddamn rocker. But yeah, solid analysis, which was an interesting learning experience for all the various media across the franchise, though I'm not really fond of any of the jokes. The funniest part to me was when Wiz said 1987, which isn't because it's a good joke or even intended as one. My brain is just mush at this point. So, the fight then. Honestly, the first half is pretty good. Not amazing, but I really like it. The atmosphere it builds with the POV shots of Fett discovering the corpses in the trees and Predator stalking him make for a really sick start. I like that Boba's 360 vision allows him to counter the Predator or sneak attack, and the rest of the fighting from then on is solid. I like the brief range battle, the arm blade and funny stick fights are really well animated, both are getting to use a good amount of weapons, it has picked up a lot of momentum. Then it kind of loses a lot of it. The smart disc bit is cool in concept, but also kind of weird that Boba doesn't see the surprise attack coming this time. He hides behind a tree, climbs it and drops a grenade on Predator, which is a good way to show his more dirty method of fighting, but the Predator stabbing the tree despite his thermal vision makes him come across as kind of stupid. The following bit of Fett cauterizing his wound with a lightsaber is metal as hell and is easily my favourite part of the fight, but after this is where it kinda starts to nosedive. The previously fluid melee combat is followed up with this weird looking mindless swinging. I wish Boba had gotten some spin on the ugly motherfucker line that fits him better rather than saying it verbatim. Predator knocks him down and then stops for whatever reason. I know he can't see Fett, but he should still be able to see the lightsaber and there's no reason for him to believe that he's moved. Then Fett floors him by cutting just the plasma scythe, and then Predator uses the self-destruct as a way to try and kill Fett when it's something that's only supposed to be used as a means to erase all evidence of itself while giving its killer a chance to escape. It's also framed like Fett takes it head on at the epicenter when the conclusion makes the point that he'd need to get 50 meters away from it. It's such a shame because they were doing so well and then the climax of the fight devolves into borderline incoherent nonsense, and a lot of the fixes seem like they'd be really simple in theory. Tweak the reference line to have Boba say something like I've seen worse which acknowledges the iconic quote but fits his character better, have him turn off the lightsaber when he's on the floor and dodge the final scythe swing so he's able to get the jump on Predator with an attack that actually makes contact, and show him escaping the danger zone of the self-destruct by the skin of his teeth. 
I think this ranking segment has turned out about as long as my dedicated review of the episode, which is kind of funny to me. But yeah, I still stand by this being a good episode. Not one I feel especially strongly towards, and I do still prefer Fett vs. Samus Remastered, but a rewatch did make the good stuff here stick out even more. Good stuff that I feel like the community has kind of brushed past because this happened to be unfortunately the weakest outing in the first half of the season. It's basically the single episode equivalent of season 7. After following up a bunch of widely beloved episodes, this one sticks out as the disappointment because it was merely good in a sea of seasonal highlights. I mean, yeah, it is the end of the streak of bangers for a lot of people, but that was kind of inevitable to happen. No show is going to be able to put out nothing but banger episodes all the time, it's just not feasible. Looking at it on its own merits, this is still pretty decent, and I'd say it's worth revisiting to give another shot. Sure, the problems may stick out more, but the good stuff is worth it, I think. Lightning pours from the clouds. I'm not going to be making many friends with the Dragon Ball fanbase today, am I? I really like Thor vs. Vegeta. I can't say it sticks out as one of my favorites of the season, though, like it does for so many other people. This is one of the most common picks I've seen for number one on these kinds of lists, or at least it was back during the mid season break. I don't know if that's changed at all. And to an extent, I can actually agree. The best stuff in this episode is some of the best in all of season nine. The music, absolutely phenomenal. The fake out at the end genuinely got me on my first viewing. The way it's framed with the music slowing down makes it really effective at faking the viewer out. And the final flash is a season highlight for sure. The death? Nasty as hell. I love it just as much as I love Thor screaming into the distance once the battle is over. The voice acting? Top notch. Jonah Scott reprises Thor way better than he did in season 4, outside of the kind of weak shout for the even weaker looking god blast, and Lanny's Vegeta is as amazing as I'd expect. The screams are especially well delivered. I hope they checked on him to make sure he wasn't being stabbed in front of the microphone. So yeah, there's a lot of outstanding elements here that act as the pieces for what could have been one of my all-time favourites, but the connecting tissue is non existent system. I'm not really a fan of the whole X character featuring Y criticism I've seen going around. I know I've said that before in regards to Goro versus Machamp, but that was less a case of Goro got absolutely shat on, and more that Machamp was that entertaining and entirely stole the show for me. But it's become a recurring thing I've seen in the community whenever two characters don't get an exact equal amount of standout moments, one of which I'll get to in a later segment. Thor vs Vegeta though is a fight I think it absolutely applies to. They go kinda back and forth during the warm up at the start, but once Vegeta goes blue skipping all his other forms, Thor stops trying for a while. Blue Vegeta wallops him for a bit, Thor absorbs one attack, makes Vegeta fall over, fails to put a dent in Ultra Ego, then goes back to getting walloped again until he goes Warrior's Madness and then immediately matches Vegeta blow for blow before killing him in three shots. Not only is that some bad pacing, but it makes for a not very interesting fight dynamic. Compare that to these two season 1 outings. Vegeta vs Shadow was also pretty one sided, but that was also the point. It was more about if Vegeta could outlast Super Shadow's onslaught and even then he still held his own, and that episode's strengths rely more on its comedy regardless. Thor vs Raiden had a much more even back and forth, but it also took care to have Raiden avoid the hammer until the very end, where the first blow landed with it tears him in half like they say in the conclusion. In Thor vs Vegeta, the choreography isn't just not very good, it's not very there. It especially sucks because there are some good ideas in there. Vegeta failing to catch Mjolnir is funny, but it barely even counts as a hit and it's the most Thor does for that entire portion of the battle. The Ultra Ego transformation is cool, but it's just Vegeta bullying Thor some more rather than pushing himself out of a corner he was backed into. I'm not too big on some of the dialogue either. They have some fun original lines at the beginning, but after that it becomes mostly quotes that don't all fit. The Infinity War reference would have been cool if Vegeta had done something to prompt it, but it feels forced as is. The way the do you feel fear exchange was followed on from was cool, but the initial line doesn't really make sense in context. The reason it worked against Android 19 was because Vegeta genuinely did not know if the robot could feel fear, so it was a question that made sense to ask while turning it into a threat. But he knows that gods can feel fear, so what was even the point? He just ignores a line from Thor prior that could have made for a way better exchange that didn't tread on the exact same ground as his first episode. I feel really bad about this one because it was so close to being excellent. It just needed to have more of an even fight dynamic than being the Vegeta show until the very end. I'm not exactly after anything complex, this is very much a flying brick fight, but in that case I'd rather it be two bricks thrown at each other than one brick being picked up and repeatedly dropped on the other. Still, the climax and ending are as breathtaking as everyone says they are, and while the road it took to get there was incredibly flawed, it's still a very well animated and overall pretty fight with good music to keep up the level of excitement, and there are a few really cool bits here and there. It also has a good analysis which I forgot to mention, easily the best one either of these characters ever got. 
Not an all-time favourite, and it's held back a bit by these two being returners, with the stat side of things especially feeling beyond repetitive with what we've seen already. But it covers their stories and character arcs nicely, with a couple funny hahas here and there. Thor's analysis has a cutaway that I like a lot, as well as a lot of good uses of the royalty-free music that add to the biblical scale they hype him up on. Still, I'm glad this is a favourite for so many people, but I'm only getting that level of enjoyment from a few select aspects of it. It still averages out to a really good episode, I like it quite a bit. I hope your birthday is as magical as Batman's crystals, man! Scarlet Witch vs. Zatanna seems like one of the more widely disliked episodes of the season within what I've seen in the community. Though that mostly seems to come from the people who've actively researched the characters and disagree with how they handled the cosmology and scaling. You know, the boring stuff. That is not an aspect of the show I care about, so I am perfectly content with enjoying the episode as it is. Analysis is pretty good. The tonal difference between them is very fitting, with Wanda's feeling more like they're tackling an eldritch horror, while Zatanna's is more about her being the funny magic girl. Jocelyn appearing is quite nice to see, Wes reading off their absurd list of abilities was delivered really well, Boomstick got cut off before he could make any kind of coherent punchline in the Wanda cutaway. Good stuff. I like how different it feels from other Cape Shit analyses as well. I never expected to hear the word omniversal used on the show given how they simplified other characters on that same level for the sake of the casual audience before. The conclusion being less about stats and more about mindset makes this match way more interesting to me. More like this, please. The fight, on the other hand, doesn't start out too great. The setup is kind of weak, the chain battle is hardly anything. Hulk vs Superman is boring as shit, which is an insane sentence to me. Yeah, not much going on here. All this first half has going for it in terms of standout moments is the Superman punch, which is amazing and I love how the track seems more triumphant when he appears. And uh, I, I guess the rabbit onslaught is kind of amusing, but then Wanda explodes them all and I become sad. Once Wanda grows giant though, that's when we start getting into the good stuff. The Megamind reference is frankly the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life, and I like that they start getting more out there with their weirder magic by having them both exit the universe and grow larger than it. I like that this removes the aspect ratio bars as well after Zatanna reaches out of the screen, that's a nice touch. The pacing of the end is a little weird with Wanda snapping way too quickly, but everything else about the ending holds up quite well. Zatanna pelts her in the face with a trans rights universe, which is awesome. Coincidentally, I happened to rewatch this on March 31st, which is Trans Visibility Day, that's a funny little coincidence. Cassandra Ladislava delivers Wanda's screams very well, her final attack during her meltdown is pretty intense, and the No More Witches bit deserves to be as iconic as it is. Not as iconic as the ending shot though, where this amazing hand-drawn Zatanna gives a showboating grin that rivals reverse flashes from last season, dropping Wanda's halved corpse on stage after she put her in a box and sawed her in half. Can't believe she screwed that trick up. That must be embarrassing, I'm not sure how her career will ever recover. Throughout the entire fight, I really love how charismatic and fun Zatanna is. Lauren Mayfield does such an excellent job with all her line reads. Her body language helps make her more expressive too with how much she postures and poses. That final shot also has her pull open the black screen like a curtain, which I'm gonna head cannon with set up when Wanda morphed from the curtains here. Yeah, visually this fight is stellar with so much great hand-drawn stuff and pretty effects. It contrasts the cool, vibrant blues from Zatanna very well with the harsher reds from Wanda, which take the form of a creeping red mist. How Zatanna ever got out of there alive when she was faced with the Charles Xavier slaying red smoke from the greatest movie ever made though, I still don't quite understand that myself. This episode holds up pretty well on a rewatch. It's not top tier cape shit content or anything, the fight does take a bit to get going, it feels way tamer than what I'd expect from something on this kind of reality breaking scale, and Zatanna did kind of have to carry it with how comparatively less entertaining Wanda was, but man did she carry it, delivering on some great moments in this still fairly creative visual treat of a battle. Shazoo! That's actually kind of charming in a silly way. Given that Black Adam vs. Apocalypse Marvel Comics X-Men was one of my most anticipated episodes of the season, you may think it being ranked this relatively low means I find it disappointing. But not at all, I love this a lot. It just had the misfortune of going against the most stacked lineup in Death Battle history. This wouldn't be in the bottom half in nearly any other season. It is a more than worthy conclusion to the bit that too many strangers tried to pretend that they were in on, but I have mad respect for anyone that wore a suit to watch it. Shout out to Red Runner in particular for going the extra mile and bringing in some fake drink props as well. That's the kind of commitment to the bit you'll love to see. Black Adam's analysis was pretty good. The cutaway was unintrusive and I liked their coverage of Adam's story. Boomstick said Shazoo and it was quite literally the most I've ever laughed at anything ever. The magic Batman reference watered my crops and cured all my ailments. A good time was had by all. I think it's blown out of the water by the apocalypse rundown though. The story coverage remains as strong as with Adam, except this one has more jokes that I found funny unironically. The cutaway is good here as well. I like how both of them are used to have a small visual gag or prop that they don't stop the analysis for completely. Everything gets to flow very naturally. What props this way above Adam's analysis for me though is partly because of Apocalypse's more interesting toolkit, but more because I think the royalty free music they use sets a much grander and more epic tone. And the ending stands out as one of my all time favourites. Go off DJ. 
The fight is great too. This isn't some character study like Magneto vs Tetsuo. This episode has one thing it wants to do. Include as much cool shit as possible. And it does that one thing really, really well. Though I will say, remember earlier when I said to come back to another example of the X featuring Y criticism that I don't agree with at all? I mean, I hope you remember, it was only like two segments ago. That is this episode's. I've seen more than a few people calling this fight Apocalypse featuring Black Adam. I, I don't see it. Is it because Apocalypse dominates them all fight? No, because Adam's able to cause some visible damage, put Apocalypse on the back foot and force him to regenerate at parts, while matching him fairly well blow for blow most of the time. The only part where I could say it fell off in that regard was Apocalypse casually blocking his punches at the start. Is it because Apocalypse gets more standout moments? I won't deny that Apocalypse has a lot of my favourite shots and scenes, but that's not enough for me to say that Adam gets shafted. Apocalypse's big moments are flashier and visually cooler because he's Apocalypse. He's all about that large imposing figure and overwhelming presence. And it's not like Adam gets nothing, because while Apocalypse gets a lot of cool standout shots due to his powers, Adam's standout bits stem from his personality and indomitable will. Apocalypse has him swarmed with minions while insisting that Adam will fear him. Adam puts on the yellow lantern ring and turns it around on him. Apocalypse is towering over all of Kandak. Adam continues to press forward and tells him to piss off. Apocalypse wounds him to the point where he can't even move. Adam summons the living lightning and vaporizes his kaiju sized body. I do agree with the criticisms towards the following bit of him actually giving up, and I think there are ways the idea of the lightning being depleted could have been conveyed better, either having Apocalypse cut him off or having Adam finish the first shout, try again, and then say oh shit, but that's one small scene near the end, and it's not enough of a grievance to detract from the overall package too much. With that aside, the rest of this animation is cool as shit. The comic opening panel that comes back in the end? That's a very nice unique opener. The flying brick action? Some of the best conveyances of speed all season, and I love when they take the moon out. The dialogue exchanges that come from the two reading each other's minds and using their real names. Not only are they great lines, but they're also voiced incredibly well by Cameron Nicard and Wolf Williams. Every single shot of Apocalypse's imposing figure, visually stunning. Same can be said for the whole fight with one of the best looking 3D backgrounds in the show. The track? Not a particularly fitting genre, I'd imagine, but I actually quite like it. It keeps up a high level of energy, gets dramatic towards the end, and has some ironically funny lyrics that still crack me up. I'm still not over I'm powerful, I punch the best being an actual lyric in a death battle track. And the death where Apocalypse revels stomping Adam's face in, cracking the screen in the process before he makes Adam look over his destroyed home that he's failed to protect, then frying him with his own lightning? Look up the word brutal on thesaurus.com and pretend I said all the entries on that page. The rock eyebrow Ray's face might be a little too silly, but it's not a huge issue for me. The camera crack even carries over into the conclusion, which apparently some people take issue with because it makes no sense, but shut up, it's a fun and unintrusive visual gag. There's not much else to discuss. This episode is very simple but very effective for me. It might actually be in my top 5 favourite Marvel vs DC episodes. The Holy Trinity from seasons 2 and 3 still far surpass it as some of my all time favourite death battles ever made, and I do prefer Red Hood vs Winter Soldier by a bit, but this makes for a pretty neck and neck competition with another episode for that number 5 spot. Don't tell DJ what the other episode is. Monkey. Heracles vs Sun Wukong is a good episode. Uh, it's no use. Wow, I did not give Trunks vs. Silver its due credit in this show. Okay, fine, I'll talk about Herc vs. Wukong. I've kind of avoided talking too in-depth about this one, and that's mainly because every time I've had a discussion about it outside of one server I share with friends, it is always miserable. Between the people taking the Randy vs. Cooley man moral high ground, or treating this like the forbidden cursed episode that'll unleash the plagues of Egypt if you speak its name, and the people who physically cannot bring the episode up without reducing Wukong to Haha, <laughs> it's Goku! It's just been kind of an insufferable community response. The best part is that I'm told the only part of the community I was in at the time was the only part being particularly dire about it, and that everyone else was relatively chill. Woo, I love it here. This hasn't affected my opinion on the episode by the way, it's just made me way less enthused to talk about it, because otherwise, I really love this one. Well, mostly, it does still have one major problem I had before. Last year I said the death was a very mixed bag for me, but the more time I've had to sit with this one, the more I've realised that this is my least favourite ending of the season. It's visually cool, and Hero's Journey remains a great track to the very end, but the constellation getting involved at all feels completely antithetical to the point of wanting to use these characters before their godly ascensions, and even the visuals can't stay a consistent positive, because the constellation is way too saturated for me to be able to tell what it is in the single second I have to look at it before the narrator spoils the outcome. The final clash between their earthbound selves also feels really small scale for who these fighters are, then Wukong recaps exactly what just happened in a line that feels like it was pulled straight out of Lex vs Doom, wonderful. I still stand by the fixes I brought up before 
before. If you absolutely have to include the constellations, then cut from their clash back to the fight on the scroll, change the narrator's line to the one to emerge victorious was the Monkey King, and sync up him saying Wukong's name to just after the result of the clash is shown. Then you zoom out and show his constellation in a victory pose as his earthbound self leaves. I don't know what's more frustrating, this ending being as flawed as it is, or that it drags down what is otherwise one of the most unique and immersive death battles they have ever made. There have been plenty of references to mythology throughout previous death battles, but this is the first time the medium has had combatants representing it, and it made for such a fun learning experience in the analysis. Could have done with some of the Goku references being cut, and I didn't find the cutaway in Wukong's analysis that funny, but otherwise this managed to capture my attention through both rundowns. I loved learning about Herc's labors, Wukong's silly little antics, and both of their redemptions. Wukong had so many interesting powers to talk about, the way Herc's arsenal is interwoven with his accomplishments is really well done, it's overall a great pair of analysis. And the fight is, again, one of the most unique ones we've ever gotten. I love the art direction here, with Herc's initial introduction being in the same style as ancient Greek art, and this filter they have over all the sprites giving them a lot more texture like an old paper scroll, the kind that acts as the backdrop for this fight. It stands out a lot as the only background this season that isn't a high resolution 3D render, and the way they interact with it, having it unfurl when Wukong bounces off it and later falls into the forest, and the reveal that the godly figures are holding onto it is so cool. I love the inky effects as well. They apparently took inspiration from Street Fighter, not Okami like I initially thought, but they fit this perfectly. The action is pretty well choreographed. Them hopping around the mountain is fun, Wukong uses his cloning mainly to just piss about with Herc and do a little trolling, which I'm told is accurate to what he's like, and I like that he wraps around him as snakes to reference something in one of Herc's stories that I'm not even going to pretend to know what the context of it is. I like that Herc gets to use a lot of strategy, bringing out the arrows when Wukong's too far away and the Cortalis when he's surrounded. I still love the Hydra joke, that's one of the funniest things in the season to me, and the shot of the giant staff crushing Heracles, even making the scroll wobble, before he picks it back up and tosses it is awesome. Awesome. The voice acting's solid. Life Malin does an alright job with Herc. I wish they'd gone further with his anger and moved the I am Heracles line to somewhere it makes more sense to have, but the lines are delivered well. I especially like the fed up sounding delivery on the Hydra line, and Alex Mai is clearly having a blast with Wukong, who's also made to sound like he's having the time of his life in the fight. He's not dominating Herc or anything, but the difference in their attitudes is shown quite well. The real star here though is Christian Young narrating the battle, making it even more immersive and adding to the feeling that it's the recounting of a clash of legends from generations ago. So, as much as I'm tired of hearing about this episode whenever it gets brought up, I still love it a lot. The unique direction and tone, coupled with all the other strong aspects I just brought up, managed to hook me from beginning to end. It's only let down by the weak ending. If that ending was good, or at least passable, then I might have been able to rank this higher, but the craziest part is that I'm not sure by how much, if even at all, because the rest of the episodes I've yet to talk about are that good. Let's talk about them then, shall we? Suddenly my head's Wow, I did not give Trunks vs. Silver its due credit initially. Oh, I'd give it a 7 out of 10. You want to be different so bad. I can't believe I considered this to be equal to Thor vs. Vegeta for so long, because despite not having any individual scene to match the final flash, it stays on such a consistently high level of quality all the way through, and generally it blows Thor vs. Vegeta out of the water. I was even more surprised though to find I enjoyed this one even more than Wally vs. Archie Sonic. The analyses here feel like such a breath of fresh air compared to these series other outings, mainly for Trunks given that Archie Sonic has appeared before and Sonic episodes in general aren't as frequent. But Trunks run down good in terms of feeling different from the other Dragon Ball analyses which have kind of started to blend together. I can only hear about the universe shockwave so many times before and they brought it back for this one anyway, how delightful. In spite of that and a few sleeper jokes about, it's like this thing, oops I referenced pop culture on accident, I actually meant this, for good measure. Trunks Rondo managed to grab my attention by almost exclusively focusing on the Xeno and Heroes stuff. It glosses over a Z story very quickly which I'm more than okay with. Canon Trunks appearing feels like an inevitability so keep some stuff left over I guess. Not much else to say beyond I enjoyed learning about the non-canon stuff, Jocelyn appearing was nice, and I gave a standing ovation for when Super Saiyan Rage was never vocally mentioned. I think I liked Silver's rundown a bit better though. The jokes were more consistently landing for me, and it felt like Silver's dorkish but still cool character got to be shown off more, whereas Trunks focused more on this canon of Dragon Ball as a whole. It helps that instead of the universe shockwaves it gives us a funny running joke about Boomstick being obsessed with Spawn, and I like that the others keep bringing him up to keep Boomstick happy. The animation meanwhile is like if the spectacle in Thor vs Vegeta elevated a good script rather than carrying a subpar one. The action here is stellar. It takes a little bit to fully get going, the star slashes at the start are perfectly fine if a little stiff, and the initial super transformations are underwhelming visually, but everything else about this is really hype. 
The choreography is actually good this time around, with plenty of fast-paced combat showing Trunks to be the superior melee fighter, but Silver is able to hold an advantage from a distance as he redirects Trunks' beams and tosses rocks at him. I like how both of those escalate too. Trunks dodges a redirected Masenko and Silver chucks a building-sized boulder, but then later Trunks knows to block and push through even more redirected beams after Silver rips apart the moon and chucks it at him. Super Saiyan God Trunks gets arguably the best Dragon Ball transformation on Death Battle since Season 1, being used to power through a beam that was initially overwhelming Trunks, before he brings out the red hair dye and decks Silver in the face. They then sell his power even more with this awesome final flash that changes colour in the middle of the attack, giving the impression that Silver tried to redirect this one as well, but got overwhelmed in the middle of it. And god damn, that ending. I still think Vegeta vs Thor's final flash was better than anything in this episode, but in terms of making me second guess the winner constantly, this is the best to do it all season, I think. Between Trunks being the first death battle combatant to actually injure a super hedgehog, both activating their timey wimey bullshit at the same time, Trunks going for his big finisher and Silver having to teleport it through time to turn against him, but Trunks is able to catch it so Silver has to put in extra effort to attack him further, then Trunks own key sword depowering him and glitching him out of reality? This ending goes so hard. The dialogue also peaks at the end for me. I wasn't too into their banter on Earth, Trunks trying to arrest Silver was fine but I'm not a big fan of the dialogue in the apocalypse dimension. I now know the community up and lied to me about Silver hating the it's no use line, he apparently hates when people give up hope entirely. Or maybe I'm still being lied to, I don't know, I don't read Archie comics. Regardless, I wish the line was prompted better, and Trunks' ripoff line felt like a ripoff itself. Not terrible, and I think Kaiser and Wow Who Could This Be delivered the lines very well, but there's no contest on where my favourite ones come in. Trunks' end of your future line is awesome, and the second incorporation of It's No Use is one of my favourite lines of the season. I'm amazed they managed to make it sound so cool. The track aids that a lot, I think. I've listened to Hedge of Tomorrow more times than I can count. It's exhilarating rating and I think I've finally come around to preferring it over Princes of Pride. The conclusion is in-depth as well and I appreciate that. It makes Flash vs Sonic look way more bare bones in comparison. This episode is stellar, easily the one that improved the most upon a rewatch all season for me. I already liked it before but now I see it for the masterpiece it is. If only I'd seen that sooner. She has a magic crystal? Harley Quinn vs Jinx got this season off to an incredibly strong start. After a string of DC vs Marvel premieres, they decided to treat us to DC vs a different series. Ah, you shouldn't have. No, really, I mean, Deadpool was right there for a Harley opponent. But yeah, this changed things up with the introduction of a new series and by breaking a running trend. See, there was this stigma with the show for a while that all of their women vs women episodes were either really boring or really bad. Not a sentiment I agree with myself, but I am aware the ones I like aren't exactly fan favourites. Well, in comes this episode to break that streak, followed immediately by the very next one. You love to see Death Battle in the Redemption arc. I'm sorry, women. The analysis here is pretty great, it covers their origins, toxic lives, and insanity pretty well, on top of their paralleling journeys to redemption and forming healthy relationships. Boom Six has magic crystals, Wiz mentions Harley lifting the whole 600 pound tree off the ground, and Ringmaster's worked into Jinx Rundown in a very natural way. Having a character voiced by a League of Legends superfan be a fan of the game himself feels like such a natural fit, and I enjoyed hearing him talk about loadouts and such thanks to his infectious enthusiasm and the disgruntled way the other hosts react to it. I am still yet to understand why people are dismissing this genuine passion for the game as an advertisement. Good analysis though, except when Batman says a slur, that's a bit rude. The animation's great too. I love the atmosphere here, and Abandoned Carnival is a perfect fit for these two, and it being one of the best rendered backgrounds in this series doesn't exactly hold it back at all. The fight's able to keep a consistently high level of energy and prevent me from ever getting bored thanks to the solid variety of weaponry they both get to use, and the dynamic camera movements helping to draw me into the action even more. The only times it ever slows down is when it wants to tell a joke, and the vast majority of those land for me. Sure, I wasn't too big on the quirky glasses, but the rest of the joke surrounding it is still really funny with the much calmer delivery from Jinx and how she actively goes out of her way to not hit Harley. And I still love when Harley talks to the gun and Jinx plays along with it, the wide shot on the carousel, the Batgirl vs Spider-Gwen bit but actually good, the entire roller coaster segment bookended with the Looney Tunes shot, it's a comedic riot all the way through. A mad laugh riot if you will, held by Felicia Valenti and Elsie Lovelock giving some excellent performances. Harley has one kinda off sounding line at the very start, but after that it's smooth sailing in terms of both the line deliveries and the maniacal laughs that the two are constantly letting out. Gotta give some props to the track as well. I'm not huge on it on its own, but it fits the tone of the fight very nicely. 
And do I even need to talk about the Joker Venom scene with Jinx grabbing the camera and then fully embracing her madness as all these sketchy effects pop up around her, while the mirrors make it look like Harley is surrounding her from all angles? And the death that pokes fun at Joker vs Sweet Tooth before Jinx launches Harley up with a rocket which makes this really cool looking blue explosion with her own name in it? What an amazing ending to an already amazing fight. I mentioned before that this managed to stand alongside He-Man vs Lionel and Dante vs Bayonetta in a close race for my second favourite premiere, but it ultimately fell slightly short of them. I I can't say that holds true for my most recent rewatch though, because now it's winning that close race. I don't have to make any concessions with a bad death, dated visuals, unconvincing conclusion, or early series boomstick being early series boomstick. I just get to enjoy an episode that, while it doesn't hit quite the same highs, remains much more consistent. A couple floaty movements and clashing model styles don't detract that much. It was never going to top Yoda vs Mickey though, not a chance in hell. I can't believe this season single-handedly changed my overall preference between finales and premieres. I didn't like the finale very much at all, but I absolutely adore the premiere. And that, I think, is pretty damn funny. The lack of a pogo stick fight kind of bites though, 0 out of 10. Raymond, I love the scowl, but could you slump your shoulders a bit more? Remember you're a man who just lost everything. With how fun it was for me to make, I think my favourite death battle related video on my channel is the Tanjiro vs Jonathan review, and the episode itself ain't too shabby either. Analyses are solid, Jojo's in particular has one of my favourite endings to any rundown this season. The two Nichols bit was terrible though. It's an already overplayed joke that got the delivery botched completely. That's a rare boomstick L right there. The Pickle Rick reference was actually not too bad though. I know people hate it, but the extent of the reference is literally just the funniest shit I've ever seen quote. It's not like he went on a tangent shouting, he's trained moves on whiz, before saying all those Rick and Morty fan things that I refuse to repeat. The fight's pretty epic as well. Not sure why they're in Genshin Impact, but you know what, it's a nice looking field so I'm on board with it. Actually, everything about this fight looks pretty nice. From the solid hand-drawn close-ups, to the godlike visual effects, to the way they one up Dio vs Alucard with the colour shifting at the end. This remains one of the most visually distinct sprite fights of the show and I love it for that. Everything looks stellar. The sprite rigging is on point and the combat is all very well animated. Well, save for the rapid punch at the start and a few small bits of jank here and there or attacks that don't look like they hit, but that's hardly the majority. I also love how the fight is written. The setup works naturally. Nezuko's a demon, Jojo wants to purge her, Tanjiro wants to defend her. Now I personally would have had it start with Jonathan confusing Tanjiro for Digital Tai and asking when they're releasing the 70 minute dissertation on Lex Luthor vs Doctor Doom, but you know this works fine I guess. I know this is one of the ones that feels like the characters could just talk their way out of it, but it's way less egregious than something like Aang vs Ed, so I'm much more okay with making that concession here. The dynamic in the fight mainly focuses on Brain versus Brawn. Not that either character is lacking in either category, but it does well giving Jonathan more examples to show that he's stronger, while Tanjiro strategizes more to show his edge in that field. It helps make the already exciting combat a lot more interesting. I like a lot of the dialogue which is all delivered very well by Benji Buckley and Zack Mayer. Shocker of the century that Tanjiro was voiced well by someone named Zack, that is unheard of. Jojo complimenting Tanjiro's swordsmanship and saying that he could learn a thing from him was nice. And while this shot is kinda weird with Tanjiro attacking Jojo's motionless sword for whatever reason, the line saves it. Oh, he's trying to stop me from breathing in this fight to the death, he must know about Hamon. It's such a stupid line, but in all the best ways. The phrasing specifically being does he know, now sends me every time. I can't help it, I have Riddler brain rot. But yeah, I've heard this described as the most Jojo thing ever, which, okay, maybe I do need to watch this show at some point if it's this kind of endearingly silly. The same goes for him moving his lungs to dodge Tanjiro's stab by two inches, that's amazing. As is the Sunlight Yellow Overdrive. The already solid voice performance from Benji Buckley peaks here, with one of the best killing blow screams in death battle history. Coupled with the camera moving, colour shift and godlike ending to the already excellent Breathless Blades track, this scene's a real standout. Jonathan keeps the sword in his chest the whole time too, that's one hell of a power move. And how could I not love the ending? Yes, it has minor pacing issues and could maybe have done with an extra line or two to more naturally lead into Tanjo saying that Nezuko is his sister. I've said that much before and I've offered a solution which I'll put on screen to avoid repeating, but that may have also alleviated some people's issues with the setup if they imply that Tanjiro tried to say this before, but Jonathan only now believes him that he accidentally went too far. But guess who doesn't care because the fact that they went for an emotional somber ending at all, and how effectively it works with the mercy kill and Jonathan taking a hesitant Nezuko under his care, more than outweighs any minor grievances I could have. Hell, this is the only episode where I've seen reactions that got people to cry. That's gotta count for something. What a phenomenal episode. One that pleased Sink Noodle fans all over North Carolina. If more Demon Slayer death battles means getting more episodes that look this good, then I will gladly take Rangoku vs. Mirio, please and thank you.
Jake Sex. Very glad I can now cover James Bond versus John Wick while my voice is not dying from some mystery illness. I love this one as much as when I first saw it, honestly. Even after all these months, the analysis still had me smiling all the way through. I love the John Wick movies, and it was great to see them get covered. The fourth one's amazing, by the way. And even though I haven't gotten into James Bond's films yet, I managed to get about the same amount of enjoyment out of his analysis. Both rundowns managed to hype up the characters pretty well, while still remaining grounded since these are pretty and arguably the two weakest characters in season 9. Bond's focus more on being upbeat and fun covering his wacky superhero chicanery, and Wick's is more of this feeling like they're discussing death itself with how good at his job he is, and how determined he is to see his revenge through to the bitter end. Aided by how they go out of his way to not show his face when discussing how the kid in the first movie royally fucked up. I especially love the way it covers how both men are completely mentally broken through their grief. That was all handled very well. The extended length of the analysis really helps this one, I feel. There are some widely disliked jokes in this one, like the pen clicking cutaways and them name dropping every Bond movie title, but I actually quite like them. The pen clicking one seems to just be a trigger for some kind of sensory overload for some people, so you know, fair enough. But I don't have that problem myself, so I get to enjoy the funny anticlimaxes. Though I do kind of wish the last one remained an anticlimax, but nah, details. And the Bond title drops are all just amusing to me. I know people don't like how forced they get towards the end, but I always find that to work in the joke's favour. Like, they used up all the ones they could naturally bring up, and now they're in too deep to back out. I like that. Plus, some of them are legitimately clever. Like, running into him is like seeing the sky fall. Come on, that's fun. So is the fight. It reminds me of Snake vs. Sam in a way, with how naturally they build up the world by having Bond and Mick refer to each other's alias or organisation. The setup overall is great in that regard, managing to effectively establish Bond's mission and his higher authority than the Continental in such a short amount of time. Bond's charisma and smugness are conveyed expertly by Stephen Kelly, while Mornal gives a more brooding and monotone performance as Wick, which fits the character to a T. The action is mostly pretty well done, outside of that one kind of terrible scene at the start, but after that I have no major issues. The brief pause has worked in naturally and I like that they get back into things with Bond using one of his gadgets to catch Wick by surprise. The spear into suplex and ensuing pen fight are fantastic and manage to work in Wick's history with writing utensils without making a big song and dance out of it thankfully, and it's all paid off with one of the funniest jokes in the season to me. Then the climax with the Aston Martin going out of control as they duck behind these pillars and have this cool ass knife fight, aided by the already great jazzy track Secret Service reaching its crescendo? What's not to love here? The death is pretty well handled I think, which I know is another point of contention since Wick does the whole disconnecting his controller thing, but I don't mind this one. He pushed past being shot a few times and kept fighting, the music also gets muffled for it which is a nice detail, but once Bond knocks him down and Wick loses all his momentum, he realises he is not physically capable of getting back up in time and accepts his death with no fear. Q checking up on Bond as Wick's phone goes out for the last time was a nice way to end things too. It's not a perfect episode, there is a bit of jank at the start, namely with that one scene that I mentioned, and yeah, it's kind of silly that Wick's suit gets pierced by Bond's pistol but not minigun fire. That problem could have been resolved by having Bond's bullets hit the white shirt instead, since that part isn't bulletproof. And this is arguably the weakest fight of the season from a visual perspective. Not bad, because I still think the background is great and I don't mind the character models as much as most seem to, but I do agree with the sentiment that they're not exactly eye candy. Still, very little detracts here from this episode in any major way to me. Other than a few grievances, this feels tailor-made for me to love it. Using a character I love in a more grounded battle with a longer analysis that's able to get away with fewer numbers due to the nature of the series involved, balancing story and versus stuff extremely well with a fight that's so consistently exciting and has a ton of great character interactions, it even has someone get cut off right before the ending of a sentence by an explosion. Huh, I, I really thought there'd be an explosion there. Christmas. It's still September 10th. Bet returning viewers are surprised to be seeing this one already. I've heard all the complaints about Omni-Man vs. Homelander. How it's too short, too one-sided, doesn't cover the series very well. All stuff that's made me reevaluate my stance on it and come to the exact same conclusion that I was at before, this episode fucking rules. I feel like this is the episode I've seen the most bad faith criticism thrown towards this season, because people can't just say that the episode wasn't for them and move on. They feel like they have to justify it in casual conversation. Like, I have genuinely seen people go, well, sure, the animation and analysis are really good, with the setup and kill being some of the best we've ever gotten in death battle, but why is it Christmas? As well as discrediting everything because the fight is too short. I understand disliking the episode or the general direction it was going for, but I do not understand the episode length being the sole determining factor in that, especially when you realise the animation is not shorter than average. It is three minutes long which is standard for most modern death battles. The setup just takes up a larger percent of that than usual. Sure, the actual fighting is shorter, but given the choice between more fly 
flying brick action, or the single best setup in death battle history, I'm glad we got the latter. Everything about this intro is still incredible, with Yongye demonstrating one of the best performances the show has seen so far. Sure, he and Tom Shock don't sound dead on like Anthony Starr and JK Simmons, but the impressions are still solid in my opinion, and they both more than have the mannerisms down. Nolan's tranquil fury is excellently conveyed, but the whole manner monologue is so flawlessly executed, how he'll… he'll repeat or draw out certain words, talking in a very calm but still threatening tone as he walks around like he owns the place. Him laughing to throw off his surprise at being threatened, and his temper tantrum at the end once he's covered in blood and view of some citizens are great moments as well. While we didn't get much fighting, I think it's all still pretty well done. The conveyances of speed are solid, it's got some fun non-intrusive references in there, it manages to show Nolan's edge and strength and skill while Homelander can only do visible damage with certain abilities. This is one of the few cases where the fight knows it's a stomp, plays into that, and actually has it work in its favour rather than feeling spiteful. Could have maybe done with a few audible reactions from Nolan when Homelander was able to land some attacks though. The kill is something else as well. Homelander's breakdown and final assault on Nolan, followed by Nolan turning the tables the instant Mark is threatened, are some really strong character moments. And then Nolan fulfilling his promise from earlier where he rips out Homelander's heart and force feeds it to him, aided by this incredible silhouette shot and the intense ending to the stupidly named track, this is brutal as shit and remains my favourite kill of the season. I like that they edited the music to fit more with the fight. It's one of the few where listening to it in the episode and listening to it in its standalone release are two different experiences. It is stellar either way, one of my all time favourites. So this fight is among my favourites in the show in regards to its setup, voice acting, music and killing blow. The analysis ain't half bad either. I think it covered the series and characters without spoiling comic exclusive details about as well as they could have, with only minor hiccups here and there. Shout out to the Homelander cutaway, that was magnificent. I like that both end on a note about their sons as well, that was nice. What dropped this down then? What glaring flaw kept it from the number one spot it had when I ranked the first half of the season last year? I mean last season I had Goku Black vs Reverse Flash restricted to only the number four spot because it had an entire analysis I didn't like, and Omni-Man vs Homelander honestly doesn't have any major glaring issues to me, I just enjoy the top three a bit more. Like I said last year, there are other episodes with similarly high peaks while having more going on generally. Regardless, this is one of my favourite episodes of the series, never mind the season. I was sceptical if this match could work back in that old not very good video that I did on it back in 2021, but I've never been happier to have the death battle team shut me up and prove me wrong. Really gave me something to think about. It's gonna blow your friggin mind. Magneto vs Tetsuo is an episode I've only adored more and more with time. I thought Omnilander far surpassed it back when the season was only halfway done, but rewatching them both back to back after giving them many months to sit with me, I think this one manages to just barely edge out. The analysis here is very, very good. Magneto manages to feel distinct from every other Marvel rundown, opting to go for his direct feats rather than the same shit we've heard a dozen times already, only bringing up scaling when it's needed to match Tetsuo's benefit of the doubt Big Bang. And even then, it's a different universal feat compared to what they've covered before. The way his powers were described was really interesting, I love how they discussed his character arc, and the mention of real life political figures that inspired his comics was a nice touch. One of the best Marvel analyses we have ever gotten. Maybe even THE best. I liked Hetsuo's more though. Of course I was going to be more excited for one of the most iconic animated films ever made to get covered. I find more jokes in this one funny. Little offhanded lines like college thesis forehead and stuff like Boomstick's reaction to the motorcycle accident were funny, and also they confirmed Wiz did cocaine in college. Forget the damn bear, when are we getting cocaine Wiz? That's a movie I'd see in theatres day one. The jokes are solid, but my main takeaway is really liking how they covered both versions of the Akira story in Tetsuo's arc. Character study is always appreciated in Death Battle. The versus stuff is still there, but it's not as overbearing with too much time dedicated to numbers. They aren't really needed here as evident in the conclusion. Tetsuo travels to and dents the moon, Magneto crosses galaxies and hits with the power of suns. Don't really need to get the calculator out for that one. And when they delve more into the Big Bang Theory, like I said before, Magneto's given scaling to match it. It works, and even manages to kinda justify a golden tree situation. The fight is where the script is able to shine at its best. Tetsuo being an arrogant piece of shit and picking a fight with some guy he sees floating in the air does work for him, and I like that Magneto starts off seeing him as an impudent child, but as the fight progresses, as Tetsuo loses himself and cries out in pain via his telepathy, begging for Magneto to help him, Magneto's view of him changes to that of a poor child that needs to be helped. This results in a mercy kill that I think is way better executed than the already amazing Tanjiro vs Jonathan, because this one's able to build up to it a lot better, followed by Tetsuo's dying thought to be thanking Magneto for putting him out of his misery. The ending is also where the combat starts to pick up in terms of creativity with their powers. Before I had the slight problem that them throwing 
turning stuff around wasn't as interesting as it could have been if it made use of Magneto's crazier powers, but something Nem said in his own ranking stuck to me. Not only does it make sense for Magneto to be holding back somewhat here, only going for the kelp and he is begged to do so, it also strengthens the impact of how cool it is when they actually do start using those creative powers. I mean, Magneto forming buzzsaws out of the iron in his previously spilled blood, and harnessing the Big Bang to fire right back? That's so fucking sick. And the rest of it ain't bad either. The warm-up stage is still good with the two throwing debris back and forth, getting particular use out of this one building. Then the clash that distorts the magnetic fields around the entire planet is especially cool. I love the little camera tricks they do here and there as well, like this tracking shot that follows Tetsuo, stops on this sign, and then follows it as he pulls it towards him, or the big bang engulfing the screen then zooming out to show that Magneto successfully caught it. Ego Death is an outstanding track too. It perfectly fits the gloomy atmosphere of the start and the more intense turn that the fight takes as it goes along. Neo Tokyo looks as drab as I'd expect in a good way, the hand-drawn stuff all looks great and they manage to squeeze a lot of it in, Tetsuo's burst of speeds feel really fast, the voice acting from Joshua Waters and Edward Bosco sells the character's emotions very well, it all contributes to one of my top 5 favourite sprite episodes in the show's history. My issues begin and end with one kind of slow shot and one kind of whatever cutaway gag. Everything else is immaculate. I'm glad DJ's first episode turned out so well. I previously said it may have been the best writing debut in Death Battle history, but I wasn't quite sure since I didn't know what competition it had off the top of my head. Well now that someone in my comments has compiled that for me, I can safely say that yep, this is pretty easily my favourite. The closest that anything gets for me are Widow vs Widow and Machamp featuring Goro, but one of those is more for the action and presentation rather than the script, and the other plays very heavily into my own personal biases and isn't too well liked in the wider community. Besides those ones though, well let's see, take out all the ones I don't like or the ones I feel very little towards, and um... Congratulations, Liam, you're a winner. I'm going to feed you your own heart. You will find nothing. <laughs> Holy shit, Sauron vs. the Lich King is something else, man. It might have narrowly missed the top spot, but no other episode this season goes quite as hard as this one. The analysis has only gotten better for me. It expertly gets across the scale and awe of the characters with the writing and music choices, and the comedy worked for me a lot more this time around. Sauron's rundown had the funniest cutaway of the season, Lich King's rundown had a cutaway of the season, and the rest of the jokes are all really small lines that don't stop the flow of the analysis at all to make a big deal out of them. So the ones that are funny work, and the ones that aren't don't feel like a big deal. The episode is allowed to continue with its perfect pacing. Already, this is a series standout. And that's before getting into this godlike animation. Where do I even begin with this one, seriously? Do I talk about how it's one of the most visually stunning animations Death Battle's ever put out, with striking imagery, great use of colour to show Sauron challenging Arthur's control of his kingdom, incredible cinematography with lower shots to get across the size of the characters, wide shots to get across the epic scale of the battle, and the Vizpost team continuing to outdo themselves with the 3D background and effects? Do I talk about the amazing vocal performances, with Philip Sacramento's booming voice with the Lich King conveying his might and arrogance incredibly, while Ryan Solis gets across the most slimy, sinister nature of Sauron equally well, all aided by dialogue that renders from pretty cool at worst to some of Death Battle's all-time best at their peak? Do I talk about the impeccable sound design that sells the impact of every attack, hell, even some things that aren't attacks like Sauron sitting down better than other episodes that go even higher in scale? Do I talk about the choreography, which all flows very naturally, with both characters using their most prominent abilities to directly counter each other and alter the environment to attempt to catch the other off guard, culminating in Sauron securing his victory via a killing move that, while not an all-time favourite of mine, still stands out with how he exclusively targets the Lich King's soul which he drains from his body, after Arthas is distracted by the souls escaping Frostmourne once it was shattered in this awesome shot, which is apparently also what causes his death in canon? Thanks to Noah Green for elaborating on that by the way, I, I don't know Warcraft at all. Or do I talk about about one king to rule them all. The godlike score, which is probably in my top three favourite instrumental tracks Death Battle has ever had, and possibly my overall favourite of the season? Remember last year when I praised the track in Korra vs Storm for feeling really cinematic? Yeah, if that one was an Olympic gold medalist, then this is the one that got banned from competing because how could anyone get results like that without copious amounts of steroids? It sells the cinematic feeling even better, on top of the biblical scale of the battle and characters. I know this segment's one of the shorter ones, but that's mainly because I don't have enough knowledge on the characters to comment on much about their portrayal and how everything flowed. Nem's done that twice, and I would highly recommend giving those videos a watch. He is somehow even more positive about this episode than I am. It is his favourite of the season, after all. If I had to come up with literally any complaints about the episode, about all that I can think of is Arthas 
model naturally has a lower poly count than Sauron's and makes him look a little scrawny in comparison. Some of the posing could have maybe done with a bit more leg movement, and I wish Boomstick's pun at the end stopped after just wow. That's about all I got, and it's as small as grievances get. Everything else about this episode works. Every attack, every effect, every sound, every raw as hell dialogue exchange. It all comes together to make one of my all-time favourite episodes. One that manages to become both my overall favourite SFM slash Blender fight and crack my top 10 of the show. And to do either of those, let alone both, it had to surpass that one episode I haven't shut up about for the last two years. It's kind of funny how this parallels Yoda vs Mickey in a way though. Both had a movie character versus a game character fighting in one of the most cinematic death battles ever giving me some of my favourite dialogue exchanges and music in this series. And coincidentally, both were runners up in my rankings of their seasons, only losing to an episode where a nautical themed cartoon character fought a comical superhero. That's right, Boomstick. I like how most of my favourite episodes in the other seasons give me a lot to talk about with the choreography or script, or whatever else tickled my fancy. The Spongebob vs Art Command though, I can sum most of it up with it's funny and leave it at that, but that'd be pretty anticlimactic so I'll go a bit more in depth. The analysis here is my favourite of the season. You can say the direction it went was predictable all you want, but I found it to be a highlight of the series. I loved Spongebob growing up and I was interested to hear about this specific version of Aquaman, so I found their character coverage pretty interesting. There's nothing as deep as Magneto versus Tetsuo or anything like that, but they give both characters their due credit as heroes, so managing to have jokes that consistently got me to laugh on my most recent viewing, even with the corner boxes. The jokes are well written in a vacuum, I especially like how little they try to hide how blatant of a stomp this is, but for me it's all down to the delivery. This this has easily the best Wiz and Boomstick voice acting of any death battle analysis. I mean, they normally do a good job anyway. Ben and Chad have really made the characters their own at this point, and Boomstick is as charismatic and quirky as always here. It's pretty consistent with how Chad normally voices him. Meanwhile, Wiz is having a complete breakdown over Toon Force and SpongeBob's analysis in the conclusion, and is completely fed up and underwhelmed in Aquaman's rundown. Ben's performances are usually more low-key and calm, which is good because that fits Wiz's character better, and it makes it all the more stand out when he does finally cut loose with the full singer Spice. He had sprinkles of it here and there in other episodes, like when he listed Wanda and Zatanna's powers or James Bond's skill set, but he shoves a whole shelf of that signature singer Spice into this series standout. Someone stop me if I ever start scripting something that stupid again. Wiz's line reads have so much energy behind them and I'm here for it. The fight is amazing as well. I could do a full breakdown of it, but that'd be a lot of this is a funny gag and this is a cute callback to a Spongebob thing, because there's too many of both of those to count. It's so consistently comedically strong, offering a lot of references that a Spongebob enjoyer like myself will pick up on. The voice acting by Kesson Howard and Tom Shock is on point and I love the changing dynamic between the characters. Starting with Aquaman trying to take down what he perceives as an evildoer, then his perspective being changed when he has a self-doubting breakdown and Spongebob gives him encouragement since it's something he empathises with. From then on it's a friendly spar that only ends in death when they both get too into it in an ending that goes unreasonably hard like god damn. And said death still has the characters on good terms with Aquaman making it clear that there are no hard feelings so Spongebob is crying over it, proceeding to then draw him a grave with the payoff to the one joke that wasn't selling me beforehand. It's such a lovely little character moment, something this battle is chock full of between all the great jokes and somehow equally strong emotional beats. None of the criticisms I've seen offered by the community bother me at all. The Nicktoons Unite portals are a little clunky in terms of furthering the animation story. I I'll give you that one, sure, but they don't detract from my enjoyment at all. And I think they add enough between the Trident and letting Aquaman see into the multiverse. The ending goes too high in scale for Aquaman? Oh, I'm sorry, do you want the ending? to be significantly weaker. In a serious episode, I'd probably do a rock eyebrow raise at that, but it's a joke episode with Super Friends Aquaman, I don't care. If you arbitrarily scale Aquaman to a percentage of his world's Superman strength who he has never fought on par with, he's way stronger than a bunch of the ones he sees, so he isn't the lamest and his breakdown doesn't work. What? I, I don't see their versus wiki pages anywhere here, so how is Arthur supposed to know that? Either way, it doesn't matter because the point is that he's the lamest in presentation, not the weakest. Are you gonna tell me with a straight face that Super Friends Aquaman is cooler than John Wick? So besides those criticisms I continue to not understand that much, this battle checks all the boxes for me. It's a visually stunning fight with good music, voice acting, and choreography, working in a good amount of abilities and weapons for both sides, even going above and beyond to give Aquaman a trident he normally wouldn't have. 
It's a spite fight that doesn't feel spiteful. It still gives Arthur a good amount of respect as a hero. The jokes and emotional beats land incredibly well. The analysis and conclusion are equally as enjoyable as the animation. It overall manages to be one of the most consistently fun packages Death Battle has ever put out. Sure, it might not go as hard as something like Sauron vs Lich King, or have a setup or kill or track on par with Omni-Man vs Homelander, or have a script as compelling as Magneto vs Tetsuo, but this makes me happier than any of those episodes could ever. I had a blast watching this for the first time with friends, and the same holds true for this rewatch. Easily one of my favourite death battles of all time, and I have no issues calling it my overall favourite of Season 9. And that was Death Battle Season 9. What an amazing showing. Everyone on the team went above and beyond to deliver on one of Death Battle's all-time best episode lineups. With its weakest episodes being one I consider okay and one that was genetically engineered in a lab for me specifically to not give a shit. With everything else being decent at the absolute bare minimum, extending up to the top 4 on this list being in my top 20 favourite episodes, period. The animators, writers, directors, voice actors, musicians and researchers all put in their A-game and then some. But there's one aspect of all those episodes I haven't mentioned up until now, for the sake of not repeating the exact same thing 16 times. This was the final year that Gerardo and Nick edited the episodes, and they did a godlike job. It was like a constant battle for them to outdo each other, and they hit it out of the park basically every time. Their weakest showings still had cool visual tricks that would have stood out any time prior to Batgirl vs Spider-Gwen, but their more consistent showings brought so much life and energy to the otherwise static comic panels we saw a lot of. It got to the point where I couldn't tell if some little animatics were edits, or if that's how they were in the source material. They brought so much to these analyses, and I wish them the best with their future endeavours. So, is this my favourite season overall then? Well, it's between this and season 8. Looking at them side by side, I could easily say, well, season 9 scored higher on average, so it wins. But then, I don't know if the arbitrary number scores are the best deciding factor, especially since season 8's episodes tended to get higher into their respective scores. I think ultimately, I do still prefer season 8 ever so slightly, and the way I'm going to make that tiebreaker is with how they ended. Not with the finale's exclusively, but with the entire last quarter. Season 8's last four episodes had a standardly pretty good one, the best penultimate and final episodes to any season, and the one where Boomstick gives Puppy Dog Eyes at Wiz until he agrees to cover him in oil. Season 9, on the other hand, has Sauron vs Lich King, which is godlike, but the other three I found kind of underwhelming, either being incredibly mixed bags, or again, tailor-made for me to get very little out of the experience. It's not to say the last quarter soured the overall experience for me, but compared to Season 8, which spent based out its three weakest episodes, season 9 having them all nearly back to back to back at the very end is what's going to be the deciding factor for season 8 remaining on top in my eyes. Second best season's nothing to scoff at though. Everything I said about last season having season 6's consistency and season 2's high points mostly holds up here too, with this being the only season where I would give half of the season a 9 out of 10 or higher. The cast and crew did an incredible job and I can't wait to see what they have in store for next year. Thank you all for watching. Of course, as soon as I think I'm done. It can never be that simple, can it? Alright, fine. I'll end off ranking my favourite episode of each season. And my least favourites as well, just to stop myself from getting comments about it. I'll tackle the low points first to end on a positive note, and I'll only be covering each episode very briefly. Number 9, Akuma vs Shao Kahn from Season 8. Might have not expected this one to be the least bad, given how not at all fond of the fight scene I am, but the analysis is strong enough to carry this above the rest of these in my eyes. Number 8, Gogeta vs Vegito from Season 9. This is the episode I feel the least towards. It's not a badly made episode like I said before, but I get very little out of it. Number 7, Beast vs Goliath from Season 2. It's understandable why this turned out the way that it did. That doesn't make it good though. In spite of some well done animation, especially under the circumstances Molly was in, it remains short, boring, and misses the point of the match entirely. Number 6, Batgirl vs Spider-Gwen from Season 7. Yeah, this one is surprisingly relatively not that low down. It's the same case as Akuma vs Khan, terrible fight scene that actively plays into the SFM team's weaknesses but at least the analysis is good. Number 5 from Season 5, Thanos vs Darkseid. And here's the inverse. A fight I don't like, but isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, dragged down hard by quite possibly the least funny analysis and worst deaths in Season 1. People like it, and that's cool, but it is not for me at all, and the extended runtime only hurts it. Number 4, Ang vs Ed from Season 6. It has the makings for a good episode, it looks and sounds very nice, but the analysis is boring as hell, the fights are one 
one-sided beatdown, and they set up an ending or some of the worst in the show. Ed's short jokes are annoying, the ending's rushed and anticlimactic and bastardizes Aang's character, you've heard it all before. But the production value at least makes it so I don't outright hate the episode. Because if I did, it'd be number 3, Season 4's Venom vs Bane. Nothing since this one's release has even gotten close to matching its sheer awfulness in regards to the lighting, editing, and overall lack of anything interesting. The death is good and the analysis is serviceable, but this episode is such a chore to trudge through. It could be worse though, I mean it could be. Number 2, Season 3's Shadow vs Mewtwo. Shadow gets effortlessly destroyed in an animation where nothing happens in the background is missing half the time, I love it here. And number 1, of course from Season 1, Justin Bieber vs Rebecca Black. Still the worst episode of the show by a landslide, even separated from it being more fuel to the fire of cyberbullying two real life children, who at the time just made some shitty music. If you look past that, what you're left with is an episode with pretty much nothing going for it in terms of comedy and the analysis or interesting things happening in the fight. And the entire thing has an overall tone of spite. Sometimes Shadow deliver one of the many unfunny jokes in a comedic way, but that doesn't save this episode from being completely worthless in every regard. Let Death Battle vs the World take its place, sure. That one had a winner, so ironically that was trying to be more like an actual death battle than this one was. Okay, that's enough complaining, on to the good stuff. Number 9, Obi-Wan vs Kakashi from Season 7. Unsurprisingly, this is the season with the lowest peaks, but this episode is still phenomenal. It's funny, mostly pretty well animated, uses plenty of abilities, has the genjutsu scene, the analysis is great. I love this one a lot. Number 8, Season 6 is Ganondorf vs Dracula. Maybe lower than people expected, but this episode is still immaculate, offering some of the best character rundowns and aesthetics in the animation of any episode ever made, closing off with a top tier line. Number 7, Goku vs Superman from Season 1. It's no longer dominating everything else now that it has actual competition, but surprise surprise, the show's magnum opus pushes past the dated visuals to deliver a high octane, exciting fight with the most climactic and impactful moment of destruction in any episode to date. It is neck and neck with Yoda vs Mickey in terms of which one is in my top 10. Number 6, Balrog vs TJ Combo from Season 4. Incredible analyses that give me a better understanding of the characters, godlike choreography that plays into real world boxing styles so well, and a board borderline unparalleled comeback and conclusion. It's as good as everyone says it is, if not even better. Number 5, Season 9, Spongebob vs Aquaman. I just finished talking about this one, please try and keep up. Number 4, Samurai Jack vs Afro Samurai from Season 5. How Luis did this on his own still baffles me. The script feels like it had so much thought put into it already in terms of making the most out of these basic bare bones toe kits, but then you have Luis going to the next level with a presentation, and he did this all in 5 weeks? The flawlessly paced sword fighting with dynamic camera angles, characters changing appearance to reflect the progression of the fight, and the best one stroke duel in death battle by a wide margin? That barely took him a month? Are we sure he's only human? Number 3 from Season 3, Meta vs Carolina. It holds a very special place in my heart for getting me into Red vs Blue, and that allowed me to work on projects that allowed me to get even closer to some of my now closest friends. And the unique presentation of the analysis, as well as the fight scene where Torian does all his usual Torian things, don't exactly hurt the episode either. Number 2, Season 2's Solid Snake vs Sam Fisher. Yep, it's been dethroned. But make no mistake, I haven't fallen off this one in the slightest. Every bit of it holds up between the analysis covering the characters well, the fight making great use of its set piece for a thrilling game of cat and mouse, and the best use of music in this series, contributing to arguably the best climax in any death battle. What could possibly surpass it? Number 1, Saitama vs Popeye from Season 8. If there's any episode to dethrone Snake vs Sam, I'm happy it's the episode with my favourite fictional character. And I'm even happier that it treated him so well. Saitama finally getting the fight he dreamed of is my favourite scene in Death Battle history. I cannot overstate how flawlessly executed it is. There are more minor issues that I could nitpick here than with most of the others I just mentioned, but honestly, who cares? This makes me happier than anything else in the series, and watching it with friends for the first time is an experience I will never forget. Get. And now with that, I can finally end this video. Thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed. I'm really excited for what season 10 is going to bring to the table. I bet it'll start off with something interesting like... I am fine with this actually.